With crews working to dismantle the former suborbital tank farm and make way for a second launch pad, SpaceX performs a full stack wet dress rehearsal this week. Scrapping also continues on the orbital tank farm's old vertical cryo tanks, and segments for the next launch tower continue arriving at the Sanchez site. Now let's dig into this week's update. Starting off this week, just after midnight on Friday morning, the final section of the GSEC-7 cryo shell was lifted out of its place in the orbital tank farm and set down in the roadside scrapping area. Later after the Friday sun dawn, crews were seen operating a continuous flight auger and crane, working on the new piles in the area where the new launch tower is expected to be built. Nearby, the site demolition work had shifted focus from Test Stand B to its nearby tank farm. SpaceX's Grove GMK 7550 crane was seen removing a small horizontal storage tank from its spot in the farm and placing it onto a transport for removal. Around that same time, over on the other side of the launch site, the final piece of the cryo shell that was removed earlier was laid down on the ground to give crews an easier access. About an hour and a half after its removal from the tank farm, the small tank was seen being towed down Highway 4 behind a semi. After a quick trip towards the beach, the tank rolled by our cameras and the truck headed back to park across from the D4 gate. Throughout the rest of the morning, the piling rigs stayed busy installing several additional piles to help support the eventual foundation of the next orbital pad. Over at the original orbital tank farm, crews continued to cut the section of the cryo shell that had been laid down earlier. By early that afternoon, departure preparations were complete and the previously removed cryo tank finally pulled away from the launch site and headed out of Starbase. That afternoon, vacuum trucks were again seen backing into the orbital tank farm area as crews continued to empty the perlite from the new defunct vertical cryo shells. A basket was lifted into the now empty spot in the tank farm and just 20 minutes later lifted back out and placed in the roadside scrapping area. A short time after, a telehandler came and removed the now full tote from the area. Nerdlecam also caught a small communications bunker being removed from the former suborbital tank farm. Just 15 minutes later, the Grove Crane was hooked up to a large horizontal methane tank. It then lifted it out of its former home and placed it onto an awaiting transporter. A few hours later, once the tank was secure, the lifting straps were removed and the tank rolled out towards the gate. In the early hours of Saturday morning, the LR-11000 picked up the 12-meter cryo shell load spreader, which was then hooked up to the shell over the top of the second and final vertical nitrogen tank. Later that morning, the Grove Crane was hooked up to the first of the three Amigos vertical water tanks. Surprisingly, the connection was made using just one lifting hook on the tank. It's not clear if this was all that was available or if it was just deemed to be sufficient. Unfortunately, whatever the reason, it came up short and the tank fell to the ground. Back over at the orbital tank farm, the majority of the next cryo shell had been cut off its base and was partially lifted by the attached crane. Around that same time, the previously dropped water tank had been loaded onto a trailer and was spotted pulling out of the D2 gate onto Highway 4. The tank then made its way past our cameras and headed out of Starbase. With the first tank now gone, the second water tank was lifted out of the tank farm. Unlike the previous lift, the crane was connected to the two lift points on the top of the tank and the lift appeared to go smoothly. The tank was finally laid horizontally with the help of one of the smaller Grove cranes. Meanwhile, at the orbital tank farm, the cryo shell was finally lifted the rest of the way off the GSC-1 nitrogen tank and transferred to the roadside scrapping area. Since this shell did not have any exoskeleton like the previous two, it did not require any lopsided cutting. Once the second water tank was laid down at the suborbital tank farm, the rigging was rearranged to lift the now horizontal tank with four straps and the tank was transferred to an awaiting trailer. Not wasting any time, less than an hour later, the third water tank was also lifted and laid horizontally, this time with no help from SpaceX's Grove Crane. As the tank was being laid on the ground, the second water tank was rolled out of the build site and taken down Highway 4, following its banged up friend. Not showing any love for the third water tank, workers used excavators to drag the tank from its resting place to an on-site scrapping area. 
That afternoon, scrapping on the latest cryo shell in the orbital tank farm continued as crews began cutting about three rings from the bottom of it. Meanwhile, back over at the former suborbital area, the excavators, having successfully relocated the third water tank, now switched tactics and began to smash the tank, scrapping it in place. Just a few hours later, the previously removed horizontal methane tank was at last rolled out onto Highway 4 and began its journey away from Starbase. Some of the hardware from the tank farm has already started to arrive at the Cape, and some may also be repurposed at the McGregor test facility. Late that evening, the first roadside cut of the cryo shell was completed. The lower section was then shoved out of the way for scrapping, and the remaining part of the shell was lowered in preparation for the next cut. At the same time, a whole new slew of tankers were either offloading or lined up along the road awaiting to offload. SpaceX continues to replenish the tank farm in anticipation of Flight 4, even as demolition work takes up precious offload spaces. According to Lab Padre's own VR VIX, SpaceX has now received over 900 tank deliveries since the last integrated flight test. Throughout Saturday night and into Sunday morning, the scrapping crew continued their work, cutting the cryo shell into smaller, more manageable pieces to be sent to the scrapyard. By Sunday afternoon, the cryo shell had been reduced to just the top dome and the top handful of ring sections, with SpaceX workers making quick work of the 12-meter wide shell. On Sunday, crews continued to make good progress dismantling the old suborbital tank farm. Early in the day, some equipment was removed from the top of one of the skinnier vertical black tanks. Workers then began the process of lifting the tanks off pedestals one at a time. Once removed, the tanks were laid down horizontally on waiting transports. Like the previously removed tanks, they then rolled out onto Highway 4 and headed out of Starbase entirely. Overnight Sunday and into Monday, another tower section was delivered to Starbase from the port of Brownsville. This looks like to be the first section from the new launch tower, and it was eventually parked with the others at the Sanchez site. Meanwhile, back down at the launch site, yet another section of the cryo shell was cut free. Once the remaining cap and top rings was set on the ground, the crane was detached from the shell remnants. Around 5 o'clock local time, the road was closed for another round of full stack testing. A short time later, the chopsticks were opened and moved into their launch position. A few hours later, the tank farm was spooled up and clouds began to blanket the area as SpaceX opened vents while they cooled down the Stage Zero infrastructure. Then, shortly after 9 o'clock that morning, propellant load began for the Flight 4 vehicles as part of a full wet dress rehearsal. In relatively short order, both vehicles appeared to be nearly fully loaded with liquid oxygen and liquid methane. The simulated countdown was eventually halted before reaching zero, and the vehicles were detanked. That afternoon, once crews returned to work at the launch site, they wasted no time in getting back to dismantling the suborbital tank farm. The focus seemed to have shifted towards smaller tanks and equipment. Over at the orbital tank farm, the LR-11000 crane dropped its hook and picked up the 9-meter load spreader. Then, as night fell over Starbase, the crane lifted the load spreader to be attached to the next tank. Unfortunately, the load spreader began spinning and crews seemed unable to stop it. As a result, the load spreader was lowered again and then lifted once more, this time with longer tag lines to better control it. It was then successfully connected to the final vertical nitrogen tank. Around 10.30 that night, for unknown reasons, Ship 29's transport stand pulled out onto Highway 4 through the D2 gate. The stand was then moved back towards the build site before eventually rolling past rover camera on its way to Sanchez. A few hours later, a new stand was brought out of the Sanchez site and began the journey in the opposite direction. Eventually, it arrived at the launch site to replace the stand that just left. As the new stand was arriving at the launch site, over at the orbital tank farm, the LR-11000 began lifting the GSE-1 liquid nitrogen tank off its pedestal. The tank was then swung over to the roadside scrapping area and lowered to the ground. Back up the road at the build site, a large number of concrete trucks were cycling through the area. They appeared to be part of some kind of large pour inside of the Star Factory expansion. A little before dawn, the ship quick disconnect was retracted away from Ship 29 in preparation for de-stacking. 
Workers then went out onto the arms' extendable platforms to seal the ports on the ship to prevent debris from getting inside while it's still disconnected. Meanwhile, over near the dismantled suborbital farm, a crane picked up a pair of shipping containers from behind the gateway to Mars wall and moved them over to the new expansion area on the other side of the wall. At the orbital tank farm, vacuum trucks continued their slow and steady work of removing the perlite from the remaining cryo shells. Later, SpaceX's Grove Crane and one of the smaller cranes tandem lifted a smaller tank and placed it onto an awaiting transport for removal from the site. Then shortly before 10 o'clock, Ship 29 was lifted off of Booster 11 and the hot staging ring and rotated over before being lowered down onto the recently arrived ship transport stand. With the next launch rapidly approaching, the Starship should now receive finishing touches such as its livery decals, final tile installation and inspection. Late that morning, the scrapping of the nitrogen tank was underway as crews worked to cut off the tank's bottom dome and lower ring. Eventually, the bottom of the tank had been removed and the rest of the tank was lowered to the ground. Around that same time, the tank that we saw earlier being placed onto a transporter was moved out of the launch complex and headed up Highway 4 towards the build site. This tank eventually made its way to the Sanchez site, but whether that will be its new home or if it's just being placed there to await a different ride away from Starbase isn't immediately clear yet. Back at the launch site, another one of the black vertical tanks was tandem lifted and laid horizontally onto a transporter. That afternoon, excavators were seen working hard around the west end of the launch complex. It's likely crews were both preparing the area near the old suborbital farm for construction of the next launch pad and also grading the newly claimed area outside of the gateway to Mars wall. By that evening, Ship 29 had been secured to its new transport stand, was released by the chopsticks, and the arms were lowered back to the base of the tower. Ship 29 was then moved a short distance away from the tower as the chopsticks closed behind it. Once Ship 29 was secured in its new spot, crews went up in lifts and began working to prepare the Flight 4 Starship for its upcoming date with Destiny. In the early hours of Wednesday morning, Module Number 2 of the next launch tower arrived at the Sanchez site from the Port of Brownsville, leaving just one module remaining at the port. As the Wednesday sun dawned on Starbase, it revealed that the SpaceX Grove Crane was hooked up to another of the long horizontal cryo tanks at the old suborbital tank farm. In short order, it lifted the tank off of its pedestals and transferred it to an awaiting transport. Up the road, Rovercam caught three fresh truckloads of steel arriving, with one turning into the ring yard gate as the two others continued to a different entrance. Steel deliveries have been a common sight lately, with SpaceX working hard to expand their production and office facilities. Shortly before noon, the horizontal tank that was removed in the morning was rolled out of the launch site and up Highway 4 out of Starbase. Around that same time, crews were spotted up on top of Booster 11 working inside of the hot staging ring. That afternoon, crews began connecting SpaceX's Grove Crane to the next of the horizontal tanks in preparation for its removal. Later that afternoon, inside of Mega Bay 2, a ring section was laid off of its turntable and transferred to an awaiting stand. This section is not a flight article, but rather a test article used to ensure that the welding robots at this new production station were working properly. Over at the suborbital tank farm area, the Black Buckner LTR-1220 that was recently relocated from the build site was spotted removing a rack of high-pressure gas cylinders. That afternoon, another cut had been completed on the remains of the nitrogen tank at the orbital tank farm. The rest of the tank was then lifted slightly as the newly removed section was moved out of the way and the remaining half of the tank was then lowered back to the ground. That evening, back at the build site, the Mega Bay 2 development ring was rolled out of the building and eventually headed out of sight between the Mega Bays. Interestingly, it appears that while on the turntable, the robot not only welded the section together, but it also added some TPS tile studs, something we had not seen happen at this stage before. Through Wednesday night and on into the early hours of Thursday morning, the orbital tank farm scrapping crew kept moving forward. Cut after cut, the remains of the nitrogen tank continued to shrink as the bottom was repeatedly cut off and scrapped. Before dawn, the last cut had been made and the load spreader was disconnected. Later that morning, two different trucks arrived at the ring yard, each loaded with a bridge crane girder. 
They both headed towards the Star Factory building. As a Star Factory structure nears completion, and crews work to fit out the inside with the needed equipment. Along those same lines, an elevated access platform structure was moved from the Sanchez site up Highway 4 to the opposite side of the Star Factory building. Once there, the structure was taken inside of the building for installation. Throughout the day Thursday, crews continued to dismantle the suborbital tank farm and make room for the next Stage Zero. Once again, the focus seemed to shift towards the miscellaneous equipment rather than the cryo tanks. That afternoon, a booster common dome section made its way out of the back side of the Star Factory building and made the short trip down Highway 4 to the ring yard. The section was then staged outside of Mega Bay 1. This latest common dome seemed to have a new style of cowbell vent at the top of the liquid oxygen tank. Switching over to Florida, on Friday morning, Falcon 9 Booster 1073 was laid onto the transporter for its latest return to Hangar X for refurbishment. That evening, Booster 1062 launched for a record-setting 21st time as it sent another 23 Starlink satellites on their way to low Earth orbit. Early on Saturday, Bob was seen departing Port Canaveral on its way to Freeport to pick up Just Read the Instructions from the dry dock there. On Sunday afternoon, Doug returned to port with both of the successfully recovered fairing halves from Friday's Starlink Group 6-59 launch. And just a few hours later, a short fall of Gravitas was towed back into port with the Falcon 9 booster from that same mission. The next morning, the rocket was lifted off of the drone ship and transferred to the dockside stand for stowage and processing ahead of its return to Roberts Road. That afternoon, following a little over 24 hours in port, a short fall of Gravitas was towed back out to sea ahead of its next mission. The next morning, Doug followed in the drone ship's wake as it too headed out for the next Starlink launch. Tuesday afternoon, the French cargo vessel MN Calibri arrived at Port Canaveral to offload the Cygnus NG-21 cargo module, as well as the Astra 1P geostationary communications satellite. On Wednesday night, the Florida night sky was turned into day once again as a Starlink Group 6-62 mission launched from Space Launch Complex 40. That pad's second launch in just over five days. Thursday afternoon, the fully integrated Starlink Group 6-63 payload and launch vehicle were rolled out to the pad at Launch Complex 39A. Once there, the vehicle was raised upright and readied for launch. Then, right at the end of their third hour launch window, SpaceX launched their second Starlink mission in just over 24 hours as Falcon 9 Booster 1077 carried a fresh batch of satellites to orbit. Following the successful launch, the transporter erector was returned to an upright position and could be seen venting as SpaceX worked to spin the pad and infrastructure back down to standby mode. And there you have it, another SpaceX and Starbase weekly update brought to you by Lab Padre. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button, guys, and let's hope for a Flight 4 launch real soon. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. Lab Padre out.